Hey there. Um, I guess it's kind of relevant to the theme I'm on about recognizing New Testament ministers, genuine stewards. Uh, and someone had asked me, could I teach a little more on God's economy? And I've taught about that in the past, but um, and this will be a repeat for some, but it's one of the most profound things that really changed my whole view of the Bible uh, and what God is doing set me on a different path to show me that Christ is the center and Christ is everything and God's intention is not for us to have do something as much as it is for him to work Christ as life into us and almost no one teaches about this and yet it's the mystery of Christ in you the hope of glory and uh, the word economy is the same word we use when we say dispensation. The Greek word is oikonomia, which means household order. And God has an economy through which he's carrying out his eternal purpose. And his eternal purpose is revealed in Ephesians, which shows us God's intention from eternity past. Before he created anything, he had a purpose in mind that was entirely positive. And that purpose is to produce the church, which is the body of Christ, the habitation of God, the bride of Christ, the many sons of God, the inheritance of God, the masterpiece of God, and the city of God, and the household of God. It's revealed as all those things in uh, Ephesians. And also the church is the called the fullness of God and the fullness of Christ. It is God's expression, the church, in its final glorious state, is the consummation of everything God intended when he created the universe. And he foreknew the church in Christ. And to Christ... This is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh uh, that came out of him. This is entirely positive. It's, it's related to God's salvation, but it's entirely positive, meaning that even if sin had not occurred, this was God's intention. This is why he created the universe. This was what he had in his heart that was a secret before the world began that wasn't revealed until after the resurrection of Christ. And for that reason, it's called the mystery, or the revelation of the mystery. This group of people that were hid with Christ in God, that were foreknown from eternity past, that were chosen to be holy and without blemish before God in love, and predestinated unto sonship according to his eternal purpose, which is also called the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. His grace is put on display. And then in Ephesians 2, it talks about how he raised us up and seated us with Christ in the heavenlies, that in the ages to come, he may show forth the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. See, we think of grace even in a negative light because we're so sin-oriented. But grace is the kindness that God is going to be showing us in Christ for the ages to come long after sin will not even be mentioned anymore he'll still be showing forth grace what is grace well John says of his fullness we've received grace upon grace Moses uh, the law came through Moses but grace and reality came through Jesus Christ and of his fullness we have received grace upon grace grace is not just something god does for you grace is someone god has given to you which is christ okay god in christ having passed through incarnation human living death and resurrection is now grace and uh, paul said He's the reality of grace. It's not that there wasn't grace in the Old Testament, but now, because of the Spirit, we have the reality, whereas they have the shadow. 
And they still have their salvation and they have their things, but we have something special because grace baptized us into the death of Christ and raised us up together with him to be a part of a new creation, which is called the new man, the body of Christ, which is his fullness through which he will fill all things with himself, through which he will head up the whole universe. And this entity is to the praise of God's glory. It's called his poema, his masterpiece. We're that special. You have no idea how special we are. And this is, again, apart from sin. Yes, we fell into sin, and Christ died for our sins. But even before sin, God's intention was to give Christ as life to us. Adam was a type of Christ, and it was not good that he was alone, so God put him to sleep and took a rib out of his side and built a woman. And he called her Eve, and this, when he woke up, there she was. And he said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She came out of me. So that was a positive creative act in which Adam was put to sleep as a type of death and resurrection to produce Eve. And Christ was put to death and raised up, not as one, but as many. Because he said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That is a positive aspect of salvation. A, a positive aspect of the death of Christ that is not related to sin or anything negative, but is related to God's positive intention to distribute the life of Christ and release it in death and resurrection to produce a harvest called the church, the sons of God. And this is the everlasting covenant that the Father made with the Son in eternity past, really, uh, to send the Son to be the shepherd of the sheep to bring many sons into glory. That's why he created the universe, was to be the incubator for this glorious manifestation of the many sons of God who are to be predest who are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ and glorified and to share with him in his glory. That's the church. That's the brothers of Christ. That's God's inheritance. That's his masterpiece. That's his eternal purpose, even apart from sin. And it's still salvation, even without respect to sin. But because of sin, Christ's death also accomplished other things like reconciliation and redemption, termination of the old creation, circumcision of the flesh, you know, putting off the body of sins through his death, stripping the principalities, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, all of that reconciling us. But that was not the purpose. See, we tend to think that God's purpose is to redeem man. No, uh, God's purpose is to have the church. And he created the universe with that in mind. And even if there wasn't sin, there would have still been some sort of administration or dispensation or economy in which God would arrange for Christ to become the life of his many members to make his body. He was presented it as the tree of life to Adam. And we don't fully understand what that was, but I know this, it was a life of God and Christ is the vine, and the tree of life has been restored to us. And Christ said, you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood so that you can have life in you. And he made himself food before the fall. He showed us a picture that God intended to be a kind of food for man. A nourishing supply of life. That's, in, that's his intention, is to dwell in man. He created man with his image, in his likeness, and gave him dominion. But he wasn't complete yet. Number one, he was alone, so God put him to sleep as a type of Christ and raised him up as two, man and woman, but also set him before the tree of life, showing that there's another life that man was created to receive. Every other animal was created after its own kind, but man was created after God's kind. He wasn't created after his own image, he was created after God's because he was intended to be a vessel to contain and express God's life. Uh, and that's what we've been given in Christ. And resurrection is the beginning of something wholly positive that we just hardly ever hear about, which is God's economy. The dispensation of the grace of God for the Gentiles has everything to do 
with this mystery and the unsearchable riches of Christ that produces the church as the fullness of Christ, which is his body. And for that, there's an administration. So there's an eternal purpose. And for the accomplishment of that eternal purpose, there's an administration, there's an economy, an oikonomia, a household order, okay? And yes, we dispensationalists will say that there were different dispensations. And in a sense, that's true. There were different periods of time when God revealed different truths that were preparatory and shadows. But now Christ has come and the reality has come. And for that, there's an administration. But it's really one administration. From eternity past to eternity future, there's one administration. And Ephesians 1.10 says that God lavished the wisdom, uh, his grace upon us and wisdom and understanding to make known to us, the sons of God, what is the mystery of his will with a view unto an administration or an economy, oikonomia, dispensation of the fullness of times to head up all things in Christ in the heavens and in the earth in him. Okay. And then it goes on to say that he sealed us with the spirit and we became God's inheritance and we obtained an inheritance with Christ. And then God made us members of his body and put Christ head over the body and put him as head over all things to the church. And now he's working in power by his resurrection through the church to eventually fill all things with himself through the church, which is called his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So God's administration is to head up all things in Christ. He created everything in Christ. He's, uh, he's the heir of all things. He holds everything together but it needs to be reconciled and headed up in him. Okay, so, and he's doing that by making him head over all things to the church. The church is part of his administration to head up all things. And the whole universe has been subject to futility for the manifestation of the sons of God. And then the universe will be brought into the liberty. Okay, and yes, that's a process. We'll be resurrected and then there'll be the kingdom and there'll be the new heavens and the new earth, finally, you know. So, yes, there's one administration, but there's a process with many stages. And right now we're in the age where the church is being built up to be the body of Christ. And eventually that masterpiece will be complete and removed from the earth and set up as an object of adornment in God's house uh, to be the counterpart of Christ and to reign with him and exercise authority with him as co-regents, his bride, his heirs, brothers, sons of God, and the body of Christ, which is just so deep. Um, and we'll judge angels, and we will rule with him in resurrection. Meanwhile, God has an economy for this to occur, the household order. And that word, economy, is translated, depending on context, into different words in English. It is this fellowship. So he talks about the fellowship of the mystery. It's called administration, the administration of the fullness of times. It's called dispensation, a dispensation of the grace of God has been given to me for the Gentiles. Uh, it's also called a stewardship. And it's also called stewards. So when the parable of the stewardship, the unrighteous steward was to give account of his stewardship, okay, that's oikonomia. And then also stewards. Okay, so you can be a steward in God's household for his economy. What is the economy? It's a household order. And when you put all these different words together to put the picture together, there's a picture of a household, okay? And in that household is an exceedingly rich household. And the head of the household is the father. And in that household, there are many sons, okay? So many sons. Who, and it's an exceedingly rich household and all these sons need to be furnished with everything that they need to be equipped, fed, nourished, clothed, trained because they're going to participate in the business of the household. In rich households, the sons are raised up by stewards often to be trained in the household affairs 
and then when they reach maturity they partake and run the family business and it's a legacy okay well, we don't understand that because we're not rich <laughs> but i've watched a lot of period pieces about the gentleman and it's, that's the way it is in those rich houses and we are in a rich house the household of god uh well in order for us to be all fed and nourished and supplied with everything we need god has stewards and the stewards are the gifts given to the body apostle prophet evangelist shepherd teacher and they are for the equipping of the saints unto the work of the ministry unto the building up of the body of christ to be the habitation of god the household is built by the sons of god as they're equipped to function by the stewards and what do the stewards have well they have the unsearchable riches of the household or the vast riches but paul calls it the unsearchable riches of christ see the children in the household are furnished with the riches of the household to be supplied so that they can be properly trained and grow up to participate in the economy okay uh and the riches in god's household is christ himself he is the food the drink the clothing the nourishment the supply the wisdom the training he is everything for the children of god to be fully equipped and furnished with everything they need that's why paul says you know whom we announce in all wisdom uh, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man full grown in Christ and we are to grow in all things into the head which is Christ everything is centered on Christ he is God's economy he is the way that God's accomplishing what he wants which is to make Christ the first place in all things by filling the church with himself and he does it by distributing the riches of Christ which have become an inheritance okay in the household there's a great inheritance and that inheritance has already been secured because the death of the death testator already occurred which is christ and he's also the mediator of this testament to distribute the riches that were granted in the will that are the estate of the household to the children and this is called the new testament ministry the New Testament ministry is for the purpose of distributing Christ in God's economy to supply, to nourish, to feed, to strengthen, to uh, grow, to train, and to equip the children of God to function as members of God's household. And that ministry is handled by stewards. Okay? And stewards, Paul said, let someone count us as stewards of the mysteries okay the mystery of god and the mystery of christ which is basically christ as the revelation of god and the church as the revelation of christ and how that is accomplished how it's all come about and the riches are distributed by speaking because the word is the food the word is the clothing the word is christ the word is spirit and life so the message is really important in God's household. The message is the handling of the riches, the gospel, the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and what was accomplished and the insights into what was accomplished is distributed as food. Okay, it's the New Testament ministry. It is the riches of Christ. That's why Paul said, and it was given to him to announce the unsearchable riches of Christ as the gospel and to cause all men to see or to bring to light what is the mystery. The mystery is this entity, this masterpiece that God hid in his heart and now is revealing and making known to the saints, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But not in you just individually, but as the corporate entity, the body of Christ, which is his fullness. And so Paul's prayers are all according to that rich mystery. Like, for example, in Colossians, he prays that their hearts would be knit together being comforted being knit together in love unto all the riches of the full assurance of faith unto the acknowledgement of the mystery of god which is christ all the riches of uh, un, un, all the riches of understanding unto the acknowledgement of the mystery of god which is christ and then in ephesians it talks about 
He prays that you'd receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, which is according to the working of the strength of his might, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies, and made him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He's subjecting everything to him by making him head over all things to the church. And that's what predestination is all about. It's about every detail in your life being arranged so that Christ is becoming the head and becoming everything to you and being supplied to you and you're being nourished with him and equipped with him and clothed with him and trained by him so that he is everything. Okay? Because he is the riches in God's house. He's what God has to give. He is God's economy. And he's distributed through the New Testament ministry that announces him. But that announcement, again, is not just information. It's life and light. The word is life. It's spirit and life. So it's not just dead letters that the apostles hold. The stewards who have these riches distribute them as life. And that's why 2 Corinthians is so important, where Paul talks about how we who live are always being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. We're bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. And then death is working in us, and life is working in you. And we're brought through all these afflictions so that we're comforted by God, and we have to trust in not ourselves, but in Him who raises us from the dead. The excellency of the power might be of God and not of men, so that when we speak... We're partakers of the New Testament ministry in which Christ, as a weight of glory, is being wrought into you. It's more than just words. It's power. It's life. It's the riches of Christ flowing to you in God's household as food, as nourishment, and you're becoming filled. The, the New Testament ministry produces the filling of the Spirit. The New Testament ministry supplies Christ in all of his riches to produce the body as the fullness as he's assimilated as life and light and this the the stewards are for the training of the sons not only do they equip them and supply them with Christ but they train them to handle Christ their speaking is a training because as I, I like for example as I've spoken this last year and a half there's been quite a few people who pick up this language and people call it a cult, but it's not a cult. We are just speaking the language of God's household. This language is Christ as wisdom to train you to handle him for others. So we are sons and stewards. That's the intention. That's why he made known the riches of his, uh, he lavished the riches of his grace upon us in all wisdom and understanding, making known to us the mystery of his will. Why does he need to make known to us the mystery of his will? Why doesn't he just do it? Well, it's with a view unto an economy the fullness of times to head up all things in Christ. We are actually partakers in the heading up of all things. Not by ruling in an outward way, but by being filled with Christ as life. Which is the emphasis of his second prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 where he prays that God would strengthen you into the inner man by his spirit, according to the riches of his glory, that Christ would make his home in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love would be strong to apprehend with all the saints what are the length and breadth and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. I recommend memorizing Paul's prayers and meditating on them because his prayers really reveal God's heart's desire and bring you up to a whole different level of understanding. God's intention is to produce the church as the fullness of Christ. And he wants to do that by working Christ into us. And he does that by supplying him as life and light, food and drink, nourishment, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification clothing everything he's everything to us and he does that not directly but through the new testament ministry which discloses the will and the contents of our inheritance which is already a finished job it's not a covenant that we're partakers of where certain obligations fall on us or else we don't get what he's given us no this inheritance is sure to all the seed through faith 
we've been made heirs of this everlasting covenant, which secures Christ as life for us. And the purpose of that is that we would be the expression of Christ. Okay. And what God needs is stewards and ministers who equip the saints with Christ. And then the equipped saints function for the building up of the body of Christ, which is built up by the joints of the rich supply and the operation of the measure in each one part, according to the language in Ephesians 4. There's a measure of Christ in me. And there is a joint, there are joints of the rich supply where a couple of saints come together and produce supply. Supply of what? Christ as what? Nourishment, life, food, drink, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, glory, everything. What's the purpose of that? That Christ would become everything to you and he'd be the way you relate to everything and you would be filled and saturated with Christ, not just as an individual, but in a fellowship. And that's the other thing, that the New Testament ministry produces a fellowship. That's why it says in the early church, they continued